and welcome to Hacking the Exile, the show that gives you all the little extra details you want to know about the Exile 6e webisode. Today I'm back with the star of the show, uh, my boss and uh, my very dear uh, Amelia Andersdotter. Thank you for the warm welcome. Well, we're always glad to have you here. Now, today we thought we would talk a little bit more about Brussels, this lovely city that we're currently in. Okay, yes. So, uh, most MEPs don't really live in Brussels. Some spend their whole legislature in hotels, just traveling to Brussels from Thursday to, well, Monday to Thursday is the week they are working here in the parliament. But you've, you've decided on another approach. Um, I'm, I've been in Brussels for the last two years, since spring 2010. Um, this was largely due to a personal decision, actually. I, I was in a situation in Sweden at the time when I no longer had an apartment. I could choose whether or not to try my luck in Brussels, where I thought I would anyway become a deputy relatively soon, or I could have moved back to my dad's house. And because I was 22 at this time, um, the prospect of moving back to my dad's house was not as enticing as maybe trying to make something for myself in Brussels. And I think I succeeded somewhat with that. So you've been here for quite a long time now. I was here for two years without being formally a deputy of the European Parliament. And I worked as an intern um, in the Green Group of the European Parliament. And I also did uh, a lot of conferences and some other random work in different places. But yes. So, so what's, what's your impression of the city? Um, well, Brussels is, um, Brussels is nice, it's a bit chaotic, it's quite segregated in terms of that the European quarters don't necessarily mix much with the rest of the city, but it's also if you compare it with Sweden, um, and particularly if you compare it to Sweden, it's, um, it's a city of contrasts in that you can walk from one neighborhood which is um, relatively well maintained with kind of nice stores and luxurious hotels and then you walk 500 meters uh, to the west and you will be in this place where sad vegetables greet you from palely lit night shops attended by um, a sad woman and her scrawny dog. So um, that was a bit of a contrast for me when I came here. Also it's a bilingual city so there's lots of um, all of the street signs for instance come in in two languages and it means that whenever you try to do things like ordering a taxi or describing to somebody where they need to go, um, you need usually to be sure that you know the name in both of the languages, otherwise they will not effectively be able to survey they, their surroundings. That sounds like a very efficient way to manage a city. Um, well, I mean, so Brussels is kind of the unification point of the federal Belgium, and in Belgium they speak two languages, yeah. and it's... So it all makes sense. Yeah. Now, Brussels is 19 municipalities. And you've decided to take a precedence not near the EU quarters, but sort of on the other side of the city. Yeah, so Brussels is divided by a channel that runs through, like a channel is a mass of water where previously ships have went. Um, and this runs kind of through the middle of the city or west of the municipality in the Brussels region called Brussels. And then my municipality is the first municipality west of the channel. Um, and the, and the parliament is located slightly to the east of, of the municipality of Brussels. Yeah. So um, essentially to get to the European Parliament I need to go by metro and it takes about 15 minutes because actually my area of the city is very well connected. So we have all of the major metro lines running through there which is very convenient. We also have uh, many good tram stops and so I mean public commutation is done at the regional level I suppose. Um, but in Brussels by four different companies, so we were fairly well connected and they have a unified ticketing system at least. So there are some issues that you can have with, with the unified ticketing system also, like for instance the security of the RFID chips employed, but on the whole it works um, well to at least transport yourself. And to, to make it easier for all our stalkers that are watching, maybe we should let them know that the municipality is called Molenbeek. Yeah, the Molenbeek, Molenbeek St. John's. Yeah, okay. and we also have uh, some, I mean, so the Molenbeek is a very charming municipality because it was kind of, um, it's kind of in the middle of, of uh, Kukelberg, which has this basilisk, which is a huge tourist attraction in Brussels. And, you know, like uh, on the north, you have Jetta and maybe like the Atomium. And then Molenbeek comes in between and we're kind of like, we don't really have that many tourist attractions except maybe the Olympic pool and the Edmond Martin Stadion, which is the home arena of FC Brussels, but they're in Division 2, so they're not like a really big 
team in Belgium and the Olympic Stadium. I tried to Google it actually and, and I can't find out which particular Olympic it pertains to. Um, but it's anyway there. And then in the South Maybe it was built for the Belgian team to practice before an Olympic. That could be. Um, on, online I haven't been able to find any information in Dutch or English about the history of of the Edmund Machten Stadion, and it could be a nice Wikipedia project for somebody who wants to divulge their, their knowledge about this stadium on, on, onto the world. And um, if you find any information about the stadium, feel free to post it as a comment to this video. Um, but also in the south we have Anderlecht and, and FC Anderlecht, which is the football club there, they're kind of really big, and then Anderlecht also has a lot of industrial development, so Molenbeek is just kind of stuck in between these two areas. But I'm very happy, last year we had fantastic Christmas decorations. So um, at least Molenbeek for Christmas was a very friendly and uh, bright place to be. And it's also a quite nice community around Molenbeek, I find. We have lots of cultural events and it's a nice place to, to live in. So you made, made a good choice of municipality when you moved here? I think so. I think that my municipality probably ranks among the better municipalities in Brussels. So if any viewer is planning to move to Brussels, Molenbeek is the municipality of choice of Amelia Andersdottir. Yes, you know. Now, uh, we had some questions coming in from the last show. Uh, and uh, this is more about the EU structure, not as much as about the city of Brussels. So I thought we can, we can have the questions, we can answer the questions, then we go back to discuss Brussels and maybe discuss, you know, the pavement or the waste disposal system or any other stuff that people like to discuss here in Brussels. But, but let's start with the questions. Yeah. So, uh, first question, is the EU becoming more democratic and or transparent? Well, the European Union, so, the big problem that you have with the European Union is really not so much in, in the transparency as in the timing and the amount of information. So the more information that an institution produces, the more difficult it will be to survey the totality of that information or finding the right information at the right time. Normally you will have quite well documented procedures of how, how stuff was developed at the Commission or uh, when proposals were made by the Commission or, or how they were being dealt with by the European Parliament. Uh, but finding them at the time when it's still feasible to kind of insert your own commentary, uh, that is very difficult. And even if you find, say, a green paper or a public consultation where you can make a contribution as a, as a citizen or, or as a civil society organization from, the, from a member state, having the perseverance to actually follow through the process in all of the steps of the way also presents a problem. Now, if you look at youth organizations, for instance, the typical problem you would find in there is that by the time um, a green paper has reached the state of a full-fledged legislative proposal, uh, normally that youth organization will have already had a rotation of people, so there will be nobody maybe left in the organization to, to deal with whatever the outcome was of their original input. So that is a bit of a problem, like the union being a big place requires continuity, and continuity is something that we haven't really set up good or that is difficult to set up structures for actually in in when you are a citizen or when you are a civil society organization uh, now in terms of democracy it depends on how you see it the european parliament certainly has more democratic privileges now and you could imagine that if the european parliament is a directly representative institution of the european citizens anyone who is a citizen can get in touch with any of their deputies and ask them uh, for representation at any time. Um, but there you have again the continuity problem, like, of course. Uh, and uh, you also have the aspect of um, if democracy means public participation, and democracy is kind of like the rule of the people, isn't it? And it, it might be so that we, we haven't really reached that state yet. Like the political discourse at the member state level definitely doesn't even approach what would be necessary to scrutinize appropri appropriately the decision-making machinery down here. So I think we, we, need to, we need to have somehow better media coverage of, of what happens in Brussels and also more relevant media coverage in that... Um, Often when I've interacted with Swedish media, they're, they're very concerned about finding stuff that affects very directly uh, Swedish citizens somehow. Um, and they want it to be connected somehow to a Swedish deputy or to something that could be like 
Swedish, but one would have to imagine that media maybe needs to start thinking also about how how the activities of non-Swedish deputies in the European Parliament may affect um, Swedish citizens, for instance, and, and what is kind of the mutual framework that is being constructed here. So things, things like that we would need in order to get a more transparent system also. Now I'm pretty sure that the, the viewer who posed the question uh, thought it was a yes or no question. So to summarize what you were saying, your answer to this question would be yes and or no. <laughs> well, it depends on what you mean with democracy and transparency. I would say yes. If you look at the European Union over the last 20 years, then definitely yes, we're more democratic now and we're more transparent. Uh, but of course we have and it, but it depends also on which level of the European Union you're looking at. So the Council of Ministers, for instance, which is where the kind of international collaboration between all of the member states, this is a bit disconnected from the rest of the decision-making procedure. So you will have a lot of um, um, executive, like uh, civil servants, um, administrative personnel, moving between the Council and the Commission and back like this like institutional um, transferations. But the Council of Ministers is really not very transparent at all because it's the member states negotiating with each other in there. So they need to kind of hold their cards. It's like playing poker, that they cannot be too transparent about what they're doing uh, or the other member states will find out and whatever member state discloses too much information will be at the disadvantage. Um, there was also this issue about whether or not member state parliaments should be having more influence over what the representatives in the council are doing. But it turns out that if all of the member state par parliaments are always going to have to approve everything that their government does, that makes that government very slow and ineffective in the negotiations in the council. And also because the council needs to negotiate with the parliament, um, that kind of creates an unsustainable zone. The Council of Ministers, I would say, they are not transparent and probably not transparent enough, but it's difficult to know also how to solve that problem because I can see how institutionally um, they're set up, the, the entire kind of gameplay of that institution is set up in a way that requires intransparency. So it, it, it requires a structural reform of the entire council, how it's built up. Yeah, or even of the entire European Union and the way that the different institutions are balanced against each other. So what you find in, in the European Parliament, for instance, is that our democratic powers, like we're definitely transparent, we publish everything that we do, it's very easy normally to get in touch with your publicly elected representatives in the Parliament. Um, and we've definitely be become more powerful in our roles as public representatives, but the European Parliament also is an institution that finds it very difficult to... Um, stand up for itself as it is, as it were. So normally when we end up on a conflict line with the council, then actually the parliament may not be so strong as it always should be. And this goes, for instance, in budget negotiations or when we set up like larger frameworks that um, the parliament has a way of seeing itself still as the lesser authority. And this is, of course, also um, be because in mem member state media, Clearly, the ministers and whatever the ministers do in the Council of Ministers at the European level will get more media attention than what the respective um, deputies of the European Parliament will get. So we also have this reinforcement mechanism where the Parliament also, in the way that they're covered, um, attention-wise at the member state level, are being made to feel less relevant, I guess than the Council of Ministers, and, and that might also be a problem for democratic accountability. That bridges over to the second question. Uh, is the, well, it starts with a statement, and you can of course also uh, say if you think the statement is true or not. The EU is gaining more and more responsibilities and powers from each country. Do you think this is good or bad? Should some powers stay with the countries, or should the EU replace national governments over time? It's sort of a big question. Maybe we should just start with, is this good or bad? That's a question with two answers. Uh, but I would say it depends. So the European Union is a collaboration set up in order for us to achieve some common goals, I guess. Um, so whether it's good or bad that the EU takes over more responsibilities um, depends on whether or not we believe that this is conducive to our goals or not. Now, uh, I would say, 
One of the things about the European Union structure, which is actually kind of a structural problem also, is that uh, sometimes I believe the EU should have more power and should take on more responsibilities, and especially in the areas of... Uh, so I, we've recently been discussing electronic identifications and the data protection regulation in live broadcasts from the external office in Brussels. And these are areas where the European Union could be a very good kind of coordinator and strengthener of these fundamental rights principles, but they don't want to be because they are afraid of taking on the member state administrations. Um, so what you find is that normally the EU will be kind of expanding their, their approach to responsibility and or the Commission in particular will try to um, take on more responsibilities and power in areas where it's unconflictful for the member states or where the member states are so fragmented that they can't effectively oppose that kind of power transfer. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right power or the right responsibilities that get transferred. And here we really need maybe more vigilant civil society organizations and even a more vig vigilant European Parliament. Uh, but you have also the problem, of course, that every institution normally finds itself the most appropriate actor to uh, make specific decisions. So the European Parliament will norm normally find it kind of difficult to make... When we get the proposal from the Commission, it's difficult for us to make the assessment that um, actually we aren't really competent to deal with this proposal because, of course, that would feel to us a bit as if we're undermining our own our own legitimacy and we don't want to do that. So it's kind of actually a, a tricky question um, when it's good or when it's bad. I would like for the European Union to step up and defend fundamental rights in all of the member states and that they could be doing that consistently. But should the EU replace national governments? Mm, I don't It's also one of those difficult questions. What you find when the member state governments um, take over, like every level of governance has its own purpose. And what I really think kind of maybe needs strengthening in the union would be regions. Um, so this is kind of like the forgotten, the forgotten power level almost of the European Union that um, we're doing a lot of work with regionally, of course, and also at the European level, but where a member state where, where the bad coordination between member states sometimes imposes problems. So one of the examples from Sweden would be, for instance, uh, the South and uh, Denmark. So this, this constitutes a very nat natural geographical unit, right? Like if you have both sides of the uh, Kattegat Strait and they're located geographically very close to each other and it makes more sense for them to have like a common, whatever, urban sprawl uh, located somewhere around the Öresundsbro or whatever. Uh, whereas Stockholm is actually very, very far away from this complex. And you can see here how differences in policies between Denmark and Sweden uh, with respect to uh, income taxation or, um, well, also in, in other areas like the way public transport is regulated or how we incentivize or not uh, cycling or what have you, that this creates a bit of a problem. So I think there it would maybe be good to have this external European Union arbitrator that would enable the more efficient uh, making of this anyway natural geographical cohesion. Um, but I don't see the EU really replacing national governments anytime soon. On the contrary, I think we've moved into a state of the union where the member state authorities and the national, like the government authorities of the member states are very strong. And many of them are also guarding their powers very much, maybe even detrimentally so. So the fear of some people that the EU is trying to replace the member states are false. That, sh that will not happen anytime soon. No, but I mean, what you see now at the European level is that many member states are very effectively playing out the European system against itself, in a way. So member states are very good at kind of guarding their own, and especially if it's a member state that already has a financial power or a stable institutional system, they're very good at safeguarding that system because this is also what institutions somehow do. They safeguard their own legitimacy. So we've seen that in the, in the budget negotiations that um, rather than making common projects that could be beneficial for everyone in the European Union and that have been beneficial for everyone in the European Union for a long time, member states have chosen to, or particularly the member states that are net contributors to the, to the budget, have chosen to down-prioritize every common social task of the European Union. Um, so... Well, the budget is not, uh, budget negotiations are not over yet, so we will have to see what happens. 
Uh, but I'll move on to the third question. And this is a little bit more tricky than the two previous questions that were quite easy. They're all from the same viewer. Uh, the third question is, why are you guys so awesome? That's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that this question was phrased so positively, but I don't have any answers. Okay, it just comes natural to you to be yeah, awesome. I think, I think like for me and all of my collaborators, we go about our daily tasks trying to improve the world. And uh, if other people find, find that endeavor um, good and positive, that is of course very encouraging to us. So basically you're just accidentally awesome. I think so, yes. Well, well. Yeah. Then we've answered all the questions from, uh, from the viewer. We're very glad to have gotten them. Uh, you're always free to post questions under the, um, under the shows, and we will try to address them in future shows. Now, let's go back to Brussels. What's up with the pavement? You mean the fact that there's holes in it everywhere, or that it's badly maintained, or...? Well, you can make, it, make your pick. So there are some maintenance projects um, in different... So one of the problems that Brussels have admin has administratively is that they have 19 different municipalities in the same region. And when one municipality undertakes a maintenance project, that doesn't necessarily extend to the other uh, municipalities. So you will have some areas in Brussels where, uh, where a street, for instance, is the split responsibility of two municipalities, and that street doesn't get any maintenance at all. And um, th that is a problem and a challenge where one could see how um, it would be good with some maybe transfer of responsibilities up one level towards the region that would facilitate the maintenance issue. One could also imagine better structures for interaction between the different municipalities. Um, but I think that would be the uh, administrative complexity would be the easiest answer to this question. So how's the pavement in Molenbeek? The pavement in Molenbeek is, um, it depends on which part of Molenbeek you're in. So Molenbeek is a very large municipality and we have many different um, areas. There are some areas that border on other places like Scarbeek or where we border on, well because the border to Brussels is kind of the channel. So we don't really have any maintenance problems there. There's some bridges, maybe one of them has been re reconstructed now. Um, and that's looking super, super awesome, and I suspect it's the Brussels municipality what um, was kind of the initiator of this project. Um, but then also in some parts of Molenbeek, it's kind of difficult to know where to start with the maintenance, because also we have some rundown buildings that are quite large, like older industrial buildings or storage houses that are no longer in use, and they are surrounded also by streets where you maybe want to do more maintenance work. There's been some um, efforts to restore now uh, West Station, West Station, which is um, we're going to um, reinitiate train lines to the station very soon and um, that means there's been some in that area big maintenance works like we now have uh, big beautiful colorful poles by that railway station and a new kind of station house um, but then just 50 meters to the right of it, you will have this really super old rundown warehouse building that I think that there's no real restoration projects for. Um, we'll see what happens over the next couple of years. Um, if I understand, we are working anyway on progressively maintaining also the more rundown areas of Molenbeek now. Well, let's hope for the best. Now, We've not been sitting with the coffee cups just for, uh, you know, for something to have our hands on or for you to rest your eyes or, or to you know, discreetly make, uh, advertise the European Union. We actually had them because we like coffee. But this coffee? This coffee is um, an experience for uh, everyone who works in the European Parliament every day. Um, they're made in standard cafe machines and uh, I, f frankly I prefer the office that we make at our office. Well actually a lot of offices have coffee machines I've noticed yeah. not only because the cafes are spread out and you have to go somewhere but also because the coffee in the parliament is maybe not the best coffee in the world. Well I mean there are several kinds of coffee in the European Parliament so I think one of their problems has been that they've been reluctant to raise the prices higher than one euro for the last 10 years. So it means that the coffee here, uh, rather than increasing the prices on par with inflation, for instance, they've reduced the quality of the coffee so that they can still make, I guess, the same amount of money. And you must remember then also that all of the food 
food places in the European Parliament already are tax subsidized. Uh, but I think this is the way that it was explained to me at one point, that um, it's essentially a reluctance to raise the price as much. They've tried to improve it slightly now by introducing something called the Ili Cafe. It's an Italian brand, I think, and they're more expensive. But uh, also more tasty. Marginally more tasty. I would still say that at our office we have a much better, uh, much better baseline of coffee quality. Actually, we will make a competition. The first viewer who can post which brand of coffee we drink in our office will win an Exile 6E t-shirt. Send, uh, put a post under this video with the brand of the coffee and an email address for me to contact you and you will get your very own Exile 6E t-shirt. So, coffee. If you, would like to, if you would like to remain anonymous, then of course you can also make um, a temporary email address. We contact also those. Of I course. Guess. No names, no nothing, just an email address. And then we'll sort it all out. Uh, and, well, we will have to go back to finish our coffee. This show is uh, over for, for this week. Next week, we will have our colleague Julian Benz, who will come here to explain how it feels to be French. See you then. And thank you for coming. Thank you.